Is the space Jesus on the horse with the bow and arrow that's killing everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Big, big sentence by itself. Go on. Is that in the <laughs> three other ones? Is, are these tied to the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse? And you predicted the end of the world. In about 142 years, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been predicting the end of the world incorrectly. <laughs> that number's going to keep going up. Yes. <laughs> I don't think they're going anywhere. Hi, everybody. This is Scott. I usually do the podcast out of my studio in Colorado, but I'm in Asheville, North Carolina with Ryan Duvall. <laughs> that was a beautiful sound. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by Low Pitch Juicy IPA we just bought down the street. Cheers. Cheers. We are going to be drinking throughout this entire thing. Ryan works for a company that builds software for podcasting called Oxbus. And we're in their studio in Asheville right now, which is amazing. And I'm actually using their software for the first time myself as a user. Um, I've spent a year writing this as a software engineer for the company and now actually using it myself as a user is a nice experience that I don't always get to have. Ah, that sounds ridiculous. It's so fucking ridiculous. <laughs> Well, welcome to hour two, part podcast. three. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is almost as long as Jehovah's Witness has been predicting the end of the world. <laughs> Came out here on a quick trip to Ryan's second party as a new homeowner. Live music, filmed a little bit of the bands for fun, met all these amazing filmmakers and musicians and artists in town here. Yeah, really? that was great. We had um, Ghost Stalker, who was... Uh, I don't know. How would you describe that? Like an electronic kind of synthy Stranger Things kind of vibe to his, his sound. He does loop tracks yeah, and he plays guitar over it. It's really cool. He's a great guitarist as well. Yeah. And then we had um, Shadow Show as a, another local band here who I mistakenly called a garage rock and roll band and they called it Shoegazy was yeah. one of the labels. That's what I called it. I'm yeah. not sure if they said that. But yeah, it was a good good they're, rock and roll show. We had They're amazing. Had and people in onesies and multiple layers. <laughs> we had bass players playing outside. We had wireless. Acapella screaming on the uh the, after, on the porch. The after party I think was my favorite part cuz uh we were basically doing group karaoke living room group screaming. <laughs> the early 2000s emo and some fun bands from that era. Mhm. Mm until the wee hours of the night. Ryan and I work together, travel together. We've worked on a film together recently. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And are just good old friends. So yeah. I'm out here visiting and catching up. Yeah, I met in Colorado in, I guess, what, 2012? Around there? During, whenever Occupy was happening. Yeah, that's right. 2012. 2011. Rolling into the, uh, the XJW doc part of this. W what's your backstory into wanting to make a film about this? Okay. So it's a topic I know personally. I grew up around that faith, that religion. And that faith is? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes. That's the yeah. JW and the XJW. And we're making documentary series that follows people. It's, it's really shorts and getting people to tell their story and then putting it out in a creative way with lifestyle footage from their modern life. That's a fun piece of the project. And in addition to that, Ryan flew up to shoot with us last summer this is fast forward but we'll get into it a little more and we ended up shooting something that we thought we could make into a feature documentary so over the last year we've been editing and tr doing transcription work and moving pieces of the story around until we got a cohesive powerful narrative story for the documentary and that's where the film is at the moment which is exciting because we're now about to put all the cool the fun part of it is putting all the b-roll archival footage archival photography cutting the story and making it visually appealing in addition to the powerful story. That's the next step. All right. So let's, let's step back for a minute and kind of stretch this out into, you know, a, a longer story about this documentary that you've made. Can you tell us about some of your background in this, in this religion and kind of what led up to wanting to make a uh, documentary about it? They're a very closed society where you're not really allowed. To, if you're, if your parents or your family or your community is strict about it, and they usually are, you're not really allowed to have friends outside that community. You're, you can hang out with them and talk to them for business reasons or school reasons or whatever, basic basic interaction, but not f become friends with them. Cult marking number one. <laughs> yeah, in a long list. I didn't have that experience. So I had a lot of friends on the outside. My parents were really open to that. And there weren't really anyone my age that to be friends with, really. So, And was it unusual for you to be in that situation, to be able to have friends on the outside? It was for 
most yeah for most people it was a very unusual thing but we lived in the middle of nowhere so you know ever, we had family that were not in the religion most of our family wasn't in it and um mm. which is itself kind of unusual isn't it isn't it kind of a generational thing that usually yeah yeah so the religion it's really common at this time this this a century into this religion or it's about 120 years they've been around for you to be born in and raised in and then raise the next generation in. But that whole time they're trying to get, they're trying to proselytize and get new converts. So my grandparents were new converts in their retirement. And then my parents became converts as young parents in their late twenties, early thirties, they joined the religion and raised us from little kids, me and my older brother, my little brother in the religion more or less, but sort of, you know, they were new, they sucked at it. So <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't yet graduated to being good yeah. at religion. Right. They were just trying to raise their kids in a safe place. And they thought this was better than the other ones, the other options, I guess. Do you know how, like, how they came to decide on that one? Or was it just patriarchy? My dad's dad joined the religion. He found it when someone preached to him after he was retired already. And then him and his wife, my grandmother, joined the religion. In their later years. In their 50s. Yeah, interesting. They grew up, they were both Navy, Air Force they have a long history of military families, and they kind of hated war. They also, I think there's another piece of it that's really uncommon most people don't understand, is that when you travel as a Jehovah's Witness, and before the internet, before cell phones, you can travel anywhere in the world, any country, especially the West, but really any country, and connect with Jehovah's Witnesses, and then they'll put you up mm -hmm. as family. And you right. can stay there, and they'll, you can be kind of a tourist. It's sort of like an Airbnb system, but real analog and there's no money involved. It's like a global brotherhood, they call it. And at that time, I think it was really forward and really interesting because it was cross-culture, cross-language. And is that for the purpose of doing missionary work? You didn't need to be doing that. It would just be, you know, witnesses traveled because humans travel. And they knew that they could stay with the, they call them the, the friends. You could stay with the friends everywhere. They were in their retirement, and they found this community that was everywhere. And so they hit the road. They sold their house. They were traveling. They ended up getting a, a cheap place in Arizona, like a snowbird situation. We were from northern Wisconsin. We would get you know, six feet of snow in six-month winters. So they went to this new place, and all of a sudden they had an instant friend group. And that friend group was really fun, and they're all retired, and they're hanging out doing cocktails. And they also happened to go to church, and they had that community. And then they moved to another state, and they were just bouncing around, traveling, living out of the back of a pickup truck for a while. These, you know, in their 50s and 60s, that's what they were doing. They were living this classic American um, retirement. I think that community was really cool for them at that time. They're also saying all these amazing things like, hey, you're getting old, but you won't die. You'll actually get really healthy and you'll live forever. It didn't happen. Hard to beat that. Yeah, that's an awesome promise. It's always going to happen real soon. So you better start talking to everybody. Well, let's imminent yeah. imminent doomsday cult. But let's, let's examine that a yeah. little bit further because I know if people aren't familiar with the witnesses and, and what they believe, that that is you know usually one of the first things that comes up is their view on the end of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, every religion has their kind of view of the end of the world, but theirs is imminent, constantly for. How many, how many years at this point? Imminent started in the mid nineties. <laughs> <laughs> that was a new word. The sixties was, it's all going to end in 1975 in October. That was their big thing. They try to cover that up doing big brother -y kinds of things by republishing all the same books. All the digital versions are of completely different wording. So they had an original prediction that didn't happen. So they had to they called retrofit the, the information to suit. Exactly. Yeah, and they deny Cult it. marking number two. It's sort of how China deals with Tiananmen Square. You can't talk about that. Right. So there's there's some of that going on. So imminent. I mean, there was a prediction in the 90s that it was going to happen by the end of the millennium, definitely before that, at least by then. So 2000 was a date for people that I grew up with, a little bit older than me, that were like really concerned about year 2000. And 2014 was a new date. And this is all stuff they don't publish anymore because they know that it never really works out in their favor. <laughs> so now they just say it at conventions and assemblies and hint at it and everyone speculates and then it doesn't happen. But they get all really excited about it. Did the year 2000, was that like tied into the Y2K thing? Were they like, oh, this is it. This is the beginning of it. Or was that just coincidence that that was also happening? Yeah, I think that helped their cause a little bit because they're already 
kind of doomsday and everyone in regular culture was talking about that as well. So like, well, maybe there is a thing that's going to happen. So I have no idea really why. If you grow up in that and they're making these predictions that are, you know, set in stone until they take, recall the stone and erase it. (laughs) (laughs) Is there ever a, like a communication internally in those groups to say like, Hey, did you notice that the world is still here? And that it didn't end like they've been telling us or that if that happens, you know, three, four times, like, is there ever that kind of questioning or do they just have an answer for that or they just dismiss it entirely? Like, how do they deal with facts? (laughs) (laughs) There's this funny thing. It's kind of complicated to describe with the leadership of this religion because it used to be one man and then it was another man and then it was another man, the president. And then it was this body, the governing body, they call it. So... The governing body has this ability to say we are guided by God. They get new light, their terminology. They receive new light from God, which means what they thought was new light yesterday is now wrong and completely false. But that's okay because it's always superseded by the new information handed down by the Holy Spirit, which is this nebulous energy of the deity. Oh, could could they just (laughs) blame like it's, it's man's misunderstanding kind of thing that, of course, God was right. We just misunderstood Sure. The message sort of thing. Maybe, yeah. It's really convoluted. Something like that. My whole life, I never even knew any of their names. I'd never heard of any of them, which is weird to not know who was in charge. I never had once heard ever in the 20 years I was in this religion that the leaders of the religion, this governing body, also believe that they're a chosen special class. They're part of the chosen special class that will rule in heaven with Jesus in the future. With like, And they have this special number that they believe, the 144,000. Those are the ones that will be resurrected to heaven to rule over the us lower class people. So they get to have power on earth and also in heaven. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I didn't know that the leaders had that. I thought they were they were all of the lower class. They just happened to be in this this higher position because they just happened to be really dedicated. Anyway, I was wrong apparently that whole time, but you'd think you'd know that. I, I think you might have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's all fictitious ultimately. <laughs> um They believe that they're part of this special class and they have this special relationship with God right now, which is really similar to Mormons. They have this body of men who also have this special relationship, but it's only them. Hmm. Uh, The witnesses have another 8,000 people that are – no one knows who they are, but they're like scattered across the earth who – it's an ever-increasing number of people who – um, profess this special connection with God where they know – it's. they say it as much as – they say it's as clear as your gender identity. They used to say that anyways. They probably stopped saying that because it's a new controversial topic. Mm. But as clear as it is to know whether you're a man or a woman, they used to say, you will know if you're going to heaven or not. Anyway, there's some. There's like 8,000 people. And they have published it every year how many people drink the wine on the Jesus blood represented wine on the day of the Passover. Well, assuming that they're not in this, and it's the 144,000, right? Those are the, the ones that will be saved. Mm-hmm. So assuming they're not in that, let, let's talk about the part that we haven't mentioned, which is <laughs> the vast majority of humanity that is not not in the upper elite group, not in the lower elite group that's mm-hmm. going to make it. What happens to them? They have this, I.e. Um, the rest of the human population. <laughs> most, about 8 billion people right now. <laughs> so they have this great painting I absolutely love from one of their books. They have a lot of paintings. I don't know why they like to do paintings. They could convey these ideas without painting things, but they paint ridiculous iconography that's very Jehovah's Witness. One of them is this city, you're like on a street, the viewer's on a street, and what's running towards the viewer in the scene is three or four people that look absolutely normal, like a guy in a tank top, like screaming <laughs> for his life, a, a woman with a small baby screaming for her life, running, and there's fire and like half the buildings are broken behind them like an earthquake and meteor shower like a meteor shower and what's causing all of this terrible scene all these people are about to die and a bunch of people are already lying dead in the street in this photo this this painting above this in the orange fiery clouds above the city is jesus with a bow and arrow (laughs) and he's on a horse and he's got three other horsemen and they're riding and they're all shooting people on the earth to kill them and destroy their city so jesus is like a murder king of our near future He's going to kill almost everyone on earth. He's going to commit genocide. That's the Jesus I grew up with. 
<laughs> so it's similar to Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's some kind of – some guy riding some some animals in, in the sky. So is – Space Jesus. I think I asked you this before, but is is the <laughs> space space <laughs> is, um, is the space Jesus on the horse with the bow and arrow that's killing everyone? <laughs> I know, big big sentence by itself. Go on. Is that in the Fall three on. other ones? Is, are these tied to the the four horsemen of the apocalypse? I don't. That's actually a good question. It might be, but in that in that particular painting, it's hard to tell because the four horsemen of the apocalypse are very distinct. There's a pale horse, a black horse, a white horse, and a red horse. In this painting, there's no differentiation in color of the horses. And I don't think it is because also riding those four different colored horses is a skeleton with scales. Like they all have different weapons. And these guys all are bow and arrow guys. This is ar- <laughs> these are archers, <laughs> space archers. <laughs> these are bow and arrow guys, you know. Archers. <laughs> <laughs> You're already quoting me. That's great. <laughs> that's like one image that you saw. Is that, That's not exactly the, the popular conception in the religion, right? It's not that Jesus is going to shoot everyone to death with arrows. That's not in the 144,000, right? It's not something that people talked about that much. But there's a few paintings that convey these kind of ideas. But is, that, is that idea only communicated via painting? Does it, is it ever said? Oh, it's also – I mean, so – all these – the craziest stuff comes from the book of Revelation. Mm. And it's not just I, I should say that I am someone that grew up without any sort of religious background. I have not read the Bible. So I, I have lots of gaps here on my side. I feel like I and I'm probably most people who grew up Christian grew up with this really bizarre fantasy sci-fi. And we were told it's all true and it all sounds insane and almost all of it's very hard to believe. But – it's really going to happen soon, apparently. So they're trying to kind of instill fear in you and respect for this this near future doom. But you might survive. You might be one of the you know couple million that make it. And if you don't, God might remember you because He's supposed to have a perfect memory. If you happen to be a semi decent person, but that's probably not good enough. You're probably just going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, and it's a good motivation for these people that to to do these things is that they don't have much time and it's like, well, you better ultimately get in good graces while you can. Exactly. And the, the great con here is that they're a book publishing company and now they have 8 million people who buy every one of their, everyone buys a, a book every time they release one and they release like three a year. So if you're trying to sell, get on the bestseller book list, you can tell everyone they have to read it or die. <laughs> <laughs> So something yeah, like that's like, going it's on. It's the best PR campaign of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you might die like tomorrow. So you better like get it on. Read that over the weekend and then tell everyone else about the book. What was the, the first prediction date? Was it you said 1970? No, there's a whole slew of them in the late 1870s. So the, the general brief history of the religion is there's this, this man named Miller and the people that followed him became called the Millerites or the um, millennial Dawnists. What's what they're, they call themselves, but... People eventually called them the Millerites. Is that related to an orthodontist or? <laughs> <laughs> so the millennial Donis believed the end of the world's coming in the 1850s. Then he predicted like six more dates after that before people stopped believing their yeah. idea. And it was based on this really simplistic Bible chronology with you know very, very simple dates coming you know, a little bit from Daniel, a little bit from Revelation, a little bit from this other book. Those people were not contemporaries. They did not communicate. But if you believe these religions, you believe the Bible is true, then you believe the whole thing's a harmonious whole. And the, it's not. It's 66 different books written by completely different people that never knew each other because it was spread out over thousands of years. Mm-hmm. There wasn't. There isn't a deity that's inspiring these people. So then there's Millennial Donis, and then that kind of branched into the Seventh-day Adventists, and they predicted the end of the world about five or six is or that seven the, times. the Latter-day Saints? No, it's completely different. Okay. So that's that happened. That whole thing, that whole thing started earlier in like the 1820s or 30s. Or is that a, that's an earlier like incarnation? Well, that sprung out of the Mormons hmm. and came way later in Utah. And it's completely different separate groups of people. So there's millennial Donis predicting things with these dates and the dates keep being modified and they're using different parts of the Bible because they realized they were wrong when the end of the world didn't come. Like waiting, you know, for God to destroy them on some Sunday morning. And then the Seventh-day Adventists did that. And Charles Taze Russell, the beginning founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, he was studying as like a 20-year-old 
in the church of the Seventh-day Adventists. And then he wrote a book, which is just crazy stuff. I mean, it's it's completely different religion. You're not even allowed to read anything he wrote if you're a Jehovah's Witness because it's such a different, far out there belief system. And Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like... Like L. Ron Hubbard with Scientology he was like a prolific science fiction writer that wrote, what, hundreds of sci-fi novels that oh, were he's, filled with all kinds of crazy shit. He's the world's record holder for the most published fictions ever by a single person. Like he wrote Pulp Fiction. He was one of the top Pulp Fiction writers of all time. Top three, I think, in the world. I just love the idea that someone three. did that and had like a creative mind and created all of these things that were from his imagination – and then was like, but here's the real truth. <laughs> All that other shit was just practice for the real thing that I definitely didn't make up. <laughs> the funny thing is when you get to level seven in Scientology, they tell you the whole thing's fake. <laughs> <laughs> but to get there, you're going to have to spend a half million, no, a couple million dollars, I think it is. I just listened to the Yeah, little, their the, PR campaign is better because you get, yeah, you get to buy your way in. I just listened to the Leah Remini episode with Joe Rogan. I never yeah. actually listened to anything she had to say or watched any of her shows. I will now. She's interesting. She was real in it, but she was talking about how her mom was in it. She was only at a level three, but her mom was at a level seven. And then eventually she got to level seven and found out that it was fake. Or and maybe she didn't get all the way there, but she found <laughs> out the whole thing was fake. Xenu. Xenu's not real. <laughs> Neither are the Thetans. I just did the math. 169 years, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been predicting the end of the world. Incorrectly. <laughs> 169. Yeah. If you said wow. 1850, then yeah. Well, that's the Millennial Donis. And then there's Seventh-day Adventists. And then Jehovah's Witnesses begin. They spring out of the Seventh-day Adventists. Well, we'll just cut that part out then. <laughs> no, no. It's fine. No, it's good. <laughs> it's fact check. Um, I think he started predicting the end of the world in the 1870, like 1877, I think, was the first one I recall. And he predicted the end of the world. In about 142 years, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been predicting the end of the world incorrectly. <laughs> That number's going to keep going up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going anywhere. They just need to get less ridiculous. When they think the world is going to end, is it like next year, like next month, tomorrow, like the language? The language they use is they've been saying imminent, which now that word has probably lost all meaning in that religion. Okay, so here's a fun one. They said two things. One's a book title and one is their, their language. The book title is Millions Now Living Will Never Die, published in 1925. My grandparents got that book in the 1980s, 70s, I think, just after their most recent false prediction. They're in their 90s, right? So that, that is the book title. Like millions then living are all dead <laughs> is what they could have called it. It's really it. positive spin they have <laughs> on the whole thing. Yeah. The other one is they used to say – and this is what I was indoctrinated with as a kid by my father and him by my grandfather and the church in general. It is people that were born in the generation that understood how important 1914 was in their doctrine. 1914 was. Any 1914 kids out there? <laughs> no? Okay. If you were there and understood the power of 1914 and probably were at one of their, their only talk that they gave in New York at the time, if you were there, that person – could not die before the end of the world. That's kind of how they spun it. Like the generation that understood the importance of 1914. No one understands the importance of 1914 because it's also made up nonsense. They believe that Jesus came back in 1914 to planet Earth. I'm not sure what that means because <laughs> he's still apparently in space and he's going to stay there <laughs> on his horse with his bow and arrow ready to sh kill everyone. Space Jesus! <laughs> And it's crazy. Now they, they're like, well, we got some new light about the generation. Oh, is that what they call like correcting mistakes is new light? Mm -hmm. mm. That's, it's, that's fitting. It's very Orwellian. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, my dad gave me only one book in my entire life and it was 1984 by George Orwell. Interesting. And it, it's unbelievable parallels to this cult that he brought Ooh, me up in. Let's talk about that for a minute. We've all read that. What are some of the parallels from the book that? You noticed. Okay. If there's something written that's now false or someone they want to erase from their memory. Right. They get the publication. They put a correction in. Someone has to go correct that book forever mm -hmm. in there. And that's what they do. They have a 
They used to have a CD-ROM, a library of all their literature. That was never compatible with the paper version. So people that actually want to like prove them false have bought the old books on the internet because the internet existed later and you could buy the old bound bound magazines in like a hardcover version of like the year's magazines and say like, oh, you you said it was going to happen in 1975 right here. Oh, and then this other book right here and this other book right here. If you go on the internet or if you go on their library, and I also have it on the internet now, their entire collection of, of work, all those lines are changed to be something really, really kind of mellow. Oh, like, I guess it's We like... hope, you know, we hope we survive to the end. And it doesn't say the end's going to come on October 7th or whatever it is. Like it's it's a group of people that would like because the question i was going to ask is like how do they go about like you know it's like if you come out with a new 20 dollar bill or or whatever like and then you try and reclaim that like that'd be a difficult process yeah but if you have a group of people that like believe everything you say and they say hey turn in your books we're going to give you a better one with a new cover or something and they do this and they do it voluntarily yeah so like it's not a difficult thing to change that information right and the newest book always has the newest light in their perspective. Okay, shunning is like the big thing. And that gets back to the movie that I'm making. Shunning is if someone makes a mistake in life and they decide what those rules are, and they have multiple levels of how severe they should you should be treated for your transgression. And it's always very minor stuff. I mean, it could be... Yeah, what are some examples of these these sins? If I or you... If you let your, your sideburns get too long... How for, long are they right now? They're all the way, <laughs> like all the way around your chin. <laughs> um, so you, ha- you can't have a beard. If you were to grow a beard and not shave for three days or whatever a week, you'll be talked to by a lot of people. And if you don't know, like correct that, then you'll not get invited to certain events. You'll, you'll lose your privileges. You won't be able to do certain things that are part of the hierarchical status. And everyone's trying to level up on status. Yeah. If you don't level up on status and are always trying to achieve this next thing that's really difficult and ridiculous. For example, if you, as a man, you need to start talking from the stage, like doing public speaking. It can be five-minute speeches, two-minute parts, 10-minute parts, 40-minute parts, whatever. If you're not doing that and leveling up all the time, you're getting counseled and you get demoted. You might get demoted for, or you might get to, if you, if you do something, if you say the wrong words to the wrong person, you could lose your privileges. You could do any number of a hundred normal things. You're always on edge because someone's always watching and someone's everyone's always able to judge you and then turn or turn you in. And if you turn somebody in, that automatically levels you up to the oh, next geez. thing. So it's just always this constant fluctuating battle of of like going up this hierarchy or falling down the ladder. I mean, it's similar to the idea of like Catholic guilt, right? Like you're just guilt. feeling guilty all the time because you're probably doing something wrong and there's more you could be doing. I mean, I don't necessarily understand Catholic guilt because I wasn't Catholic, but, you know, that's it's, it's the guilt. idea that there's something there all the time that you, you should feel bad. If you're feeling guilty, someone's manipulating you. That's what I got out of this religion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where do I sign up, though? Because it's I, I haven't been turned off. It yet. builds a lot of character. I don't know if you've hung out with me very much, but, yeah, solid. No, we just met <laughs> 10 minutes ago outside the studio. <laughs> it builds character. You should join. I think the, I think you should go all the way. Go to the go to the top. What's the what's the pope level? <laughs> Ooh, so that would because that's what I want. If I can't attain that, I'm out. That would be governing body. That's you have to really suck <laughs> up, suck up to people a lot. Woo! <laughs> I was prepared to go a totally different direction. Would you say that this is a governing body? Would this work? Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Solid. You need to get a really like. Poorly cut suit, though. Lots of loose fabric. They have terrible, I know terrible style. I know a guy. Some Jehovah's Witnesses have great style, but for the most part, people have really terrible suits. Where are we going? <laughs> okay. We should so, probably hone this in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Shunning. So, oh, yeah. so actually, that's something we haven't ever revealed to the public about what the topic of the documentary feature that you and I have worked on mm-hmm. together. It's not just Ryan and I. There's a few other people. Sean Walmsley. She's a great editor. She's awesome to work with. She's been taking care of the story edit and something I think she's really good at. Yeah, it's really important. I mean, everyone that's in the documentary are really integral to the story. And I think we'll be more involved as we get to the more creative visual stuff mm-hmm. and the musical part of it. Cause they're musicians, and that's another thing we haven't really revealed. It's a group of, re- of musicians that are very talented. The general story that we're trying to convey is the nuance and how dark it gets 
once people get shunned in this religion. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately my motivation for making a film about this religion cuz I don't care about this religion. I don't want it to exist, but it's going to keep existing. It's out of my control. My family's in it. I think that's terrible for them and for me. The big reason why I have any gripe with this religion and also want to make art about it and also reveal these these deeper nuanced stories about this particular religion are because a couple years after I left my family started acting very strange and treating me different deleting me on social media adding me back inviting me in when I would come visit and then not talking to me for 9 months and this and then, this was after you decided to leave yeah and my my leaving was very just I just made the decision to stop making the decision to keep going. Right. And because it was not, I, I realized that it wasn't true and it wasn't healthy at all. It's not healthy. And I was very open with my family, all my family about this. They became very culty. And that's, that's a really simple way to say it. But, you know, social media, I don't care if my family adds me or deletes me on social media. It's, they're my family. They're always going to be my family. But to have them completely reject me as a human being to my face or, and then of course do it digitally again and then and then come then like retract and say they're so sorry they would never do that because it's unloving and then six months later say some statement that's straight off of the convention from the religion or straight out of one of their books and and it's just rote gross doctrine i mean it, and, it seems like that would robotic be an, an even more hurtful way to experience it because you're like you never have a chance to heal it's just like rip the wound open all right mm -hmm. let it start to heal and then just rip it right back open you right. know like it's not just Here's your closure and it sucks and it's shitty mm. and you can't, you know, go back to this thing that you had, but at least then it would start moving on at a certain point and you never get to like do that, you know, right there. Cause yeah. they're six months, this six months, that it's like they die and then, or, or they treat you as if you've done something terrible. You know, one or the other, if, if they haven't talked to one of them for years, it feels like they've almost dead. They've almost died. And mm -hmm. it's, I'm like mourning the loss of our relationship, but I know it's still possible because they're alive and they're very healthy and they're, fine and this so this is still but ongoing it's ongoing it's been going for 10 years now so it's a complete pain in my ass for me it's this like gigantic dark joke and that gigantic dark joke that keeps slapping me in the face they think i'm doing something to them i don't want to hurt them i don't i want them to be happy and have a, a life that they're proud of and happy with but that kind of actions coming from not just them a lot of people i was friends with in the religion as well but my family is important and for them to act like these bizarre culty robots and then not and then again and then and rip off the bandaid as you say and like poke the wound it's really painful and dark and i want to expose in a really creative way how deep that darkness goes and also show that life on the outside for them they don't know that life on the outside is is okay they think it's terrible or that everyone they think that people on the outside are are they just like living in sin constantly and they're depressed and what do they what do they think that other people are experiencing how are they experiencing life for example i was pretty vocal just on social media when i left the religion in 2008 9 i was more vocal in like a couple of years in because i was just becoming really comfortable with being myself on the outside i would get emails and letters from jehovah's witnesses just just saying terrible things about me and all that changed in my life was that I stopped going to that building and hanging out with those particular people. I didn't become a different person. I became a stronger, more confident person. I was very strong-willed in and outside of religion. But they would they would write these long things, even on public, and say, it's so obvious why you left. And they would make up all these reasons. I was very clear why I left. I left for ideological reasons. I didn't believe the doctrine. I thought that their teachings were false. I let a lot of bullshit slide for a really long time. Like, their God's magical, for example. I wanted them to, to prove to me how certain things work, and they're like, God poofed it there. That's how it worked. <laughs> their words, two different people, completely different situations. <laughs> like, okay, elders are saying God poofed things around. That's magic. Poof of smoke, new thing. Constant, perpetual poofing. <laughs> <laughs> I should be in this poof. Like, it just became like a comic relief nonsense religion for me. And I, I just walked away, and I just was like... 
I don't I don't want this nonsense in my life anymore. I want to go do the things I dreamed of doing my whole life. I've been putting on hold so I can I can sell more books for you. Get the, I'm done. I'm done pushing your literature on people and trying to convince people that they're all going to die soon unless they all of a sudden do this thing. It's just so medieval and ridiculous. So I was very clear about why I left and all the all the reasons and wrote letters to my family about the reasons why I left and had conversations on the phone with them. And we had awesome conversations, but in the end, people in general just took it as, oh, this person's doing drugs every single day. That wasn't true. Having sex with everyone, having going to orgy parties, none of that's true. Like, I mean, I'm not a complete prude, <laughs> but that's not why I left the religion. Those weren't the driving factors for me to exit. I, I left for very logical reasons. That was the primary thing. And now I'm making a movie for very emotional reasons because... They have completely destroyed my relationship with my family and they got my family to do it to themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. And they sit there and say it to my face and it came straight from their literature. And I can hear, I know exactly the word, the words they're using are totally cult words. The cult ideas that are indoctrinated in their conventions every year. What are, what are some examples of the cult words? It starts off really soft. Like we think Scott's a bad association. You shouldn't hang out with him. You know, he's, doing bad things then it turns into you know what kind of influences is he having from the demons he's out in the world he's probably demon worshiping he's probably possessed by a demon then now i have a diseased mind according to their i'm now classified as someone with a diseased mind from the apostates an apostate just means someone who doesn't believe what they were taught when they were a child in terms of religion but what they, they have a new definition for that word and that's someone who's actively trying to destroy the faith of, of true believers. It's very dramatic. I'm not trying to destroy anyone's faith. I want people to think for themselves, though. I don't know who would really argue against that. Probably people in a cult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then they use Bible terms like, um, is a lion walking around on earth seeking to devour someone? And yeah, you're, you could be a victim of Satan. He's like a lion. They, they have this, this analogy in the Bible that they love to quote. And so I'm like this vicious lion. And if I come to their house, you know, if I meet them in public somewhere, like could be the end of them. If I say the wrong word, it could damage their – your disbelief is suspended. That's the word I'm trying to say. And yeah. if I say the wrong words, that, that house of cards they've built around their faith to protect them could crumble because it's so weak anyways. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, and we haven't really touched on this, but how – you know, if you have a question, you can take them to the elders who are, you know, the, the wise people in your community. And if you have questions, doubts, whatever, like they'll have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's this reinforced system where they're very confident in their beliefs unless it involves anything outside of that. And then it completely like falls apart. You know, like if you stay within the box, mm -hmm. like it's great and it makes sense. But if you even like peek over one corner. You're like, holy shit, there was another world out here. And it doesn't like it doesn't hold up to any sort of scrutiny at all. Very well put. Have you thought about how making this film? I mean, you're telling your family to never talk to you again, aren't you? After about six years of dealing with my family being on and off, cold and hot, dramatic and culty, and then completely friendly and warm again, was that they were a shadow, like a, a ghost of a family. Everything that actually mattered that the religion could do to hurt me or this relationship with my, I have with my family, this shadow of a relationship I have, it was already gone. Like, there's nothing else you can take away from me. I don't care about the religion. I don't care about anyone else in the religion. I only care about my family in the religion. It'd be great to get some old friends back, but and that'll happen over time. It keeps happening. Like, every couple of years, someone pops out that wants to reconnect, which is awesome. I only care about the family. And I realized that everything that they've already taken away is everything that matters. So I have nothing left to lose in terms of making this film. So if I put out media that is negative toward their religion by consequence of them being a cult and fucking up my life a little bit, it's okay because they've already destroyed the one valuable thing I had. So I might as well just make some beautiful thing out of it mm -hmm. because there's nothing left to lose. However, I could say the fraction, the little bits and pieces I did get from my family, the little pittance, most of that went away when I 
started releasing stuff pretty publicly for the crowdfund campaign we did yeah. last year. So that's probably one of the things where they're watching it, but can't admit that they're watching it. Mm-hmm. I can almost guarantee... Cult marking number. I'm starting to lose track. <laughs> A little tab- tabulation there. So let's talk about the film itself. and The feature? And, yes. Okay. Well, I guess there, there's multiple things that you could talk about that you're making. So mm-hmm. let's, let's, let's clarify the things that you are working on or okay. have released at this point. I met another ex-Jehovah's Witness while traveling. And it wasn't the first one I'd met while traveling all over the world. I lived in Asia. It was re- frequently in Europe and traveled extensively through Central and South America. That was meeting next Jehovah's Witnesses on a, not all the time, but on a regular enough basis where it was kind of shocking. And finally, I met this guy in Germany. He's from the States. I had my camera and I was on vacation, so I extended my trip for another week. And I just said, hey, like, let's go out a couple nights and try and do an interview. And that worked. So we, we started some content. And his story was amazing. It kind of launched the, the idea for the film. And then I went and filmed with a good friend of mine on the West Coast, and we traveled for two weeks together. And the idea was that we'd record audio and basically do podcast and do a couple of interviews and something great would come out of it. And I spent about five months editing down just that content from that one, that two week session. And that we just released, which is really exciting. But I, you know, I started creating content and then didn't really know how to release it or where to go or if, any, if there really was an audience. I'd never really looked online for extra of witnesses. So that's sort of how the whole thing started. And I got this idea that once I had this engineering contract, it was wrapping up, so I made some a decent chunk of change and then thought it'd be great to live off of this money and try to build up an audience for this film idea and do a series. But I didn't really know how to make a series, so that sort of evolved as we went, and I tried to use those a three series, shoots. meaning like a number of episodes of like, something? Yeah, a number of episodes and kind of an ongoing thing where I go out and film with someone and cut the content, and it keeps on, we keep on releasing over time on a, reg, a semi-regular basis. And that's sort of what we pitched in the crowdfund. So we did, we launched a crowdfund campaign and it was going very slowly. So we launched this crowdfund. It took me about three, four months to prepare. It was kind of making a logo, kind of getting the imagery and the fonts and the putting together a teaser that was pretty solid that we thought was sort of a prototype for the concept to kind of cover a lot of the different topics in a short video. And today I kind of look back on it and I think, it's kind of jumping all over the place in a really bizarre way. And people really loved it and got behind the project. We we went for a high number and we made even more than that. And it's because we kind of tapped into over those four months in prep, a lot of online communities of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in about 14 countries. I speak Spanish and I speak very broken German and I understand a, a little bit of French and I understand a little bit of Italian. I was living in Vietnam. So like I got, I got friends from everywhere. So I kind of pulled a lot of favors to get people to help me translate things into a lot of languages. And I started writing in Japanese and in Chinese and finding groups of Japanese ex Jehovah's Witnesses and groups of Chinese ex Jehovah's Witnesses. And a cool thing happened where a simultaneous thing happened in the middle of our campaign where this guy from Hong Kong, I was posting on one of the forums he's really regular on. He's an evangelical Christian who heckles Jehovah's Witnesses on a daily basis. That's like his life's work. <laughs> And he said he's like banned from certain locations in the city because he's a troublemaker, such a troublemaker. And there's like about 5,000 Hong Kong based Jehovah's Witness people. And they all know exactly who he is. And he shows up to wherever they are and gets his megaphone out and just starts talking about how what the Bible really says and how it's wrong. And that's his thing. Because in case anyone isn't clear, like the Jehovah's Witness is not just like a U.S. based thing. This is a worldwide you know, organization with how many members of there? It's like eight, I think it's 8.3 or 8.4 million people right now. Yeah. It's about half the size of the Jewish, global Jewish population. I think Mormons are even quite a bit larger, but just for context. Mm-hmm. And there's 193 countries in the world. They claim that they're in 224 lands. So they include like certain regions of countries as different segments of so they they've, lands. they've been to more countries than there are countries. Yeah. <laughs> That's... And, that's impressive. They publish and preach in 800 languages. That's, That's a, a substantial effort. Which is a thing that I don't like to usually promote something positive about their religion. But something I thought was really interesting is we are losing languages. And with language loss, we lose culture. Jehovah's Witnesses don't give a shit about other people's culture. They care about proselytizing and doing cultural imperialism. They want to take over. However, they are preserving languages in a really, really weird way by publishing their 
terrible literature <laughs> in those languages. <laughs> and that's because ultimately it's a publishing com- company that we're yeah, talking about. We're talking about a publishing company that wants to sell as many magazines and books as possible in as short amount of time as possible before the end of the it's world. It's similar to Reader's Digest. <laughs> Does that even exist anymore? I don't know, but I still see them around. <laughs> so the crowdfunding. So take us that through guy. that that process. Okay. Like, you, you, what was your your amount that you were trying to raise initially? Nine thousand dollars is what we chose to go on, and over what time period? Four weeks. Okay, so like, can you kind of give it, guide us mm-hmm. through that process, like the where you were at at a certain time period, and because I think that's when Mr. Hong Kong comes in, right? Yeah. So maybe just to the short summary is that Hong Kong guy says I can't tell his name. He wants to remain anonymous. He drops a thousand dollars on the project. That's the biggest donation we got at that one ninth of it already. Yeah. Yeah. And then a couple days later, he says, what's your strategy? What's your strategy? And I said, well, these, I'm trying all these things. I'm talking to all these different people. You've got to do something smarter than how about this? I'm going to do a match campaign. I'll go put another $1,000 if you get another $1,000. So everyone that donates a dollar, it's actually worth $2 up to mm-hmm. this point. And you have you know the rest of the two weeks of the campaign to get it. So, so you're, I, you're half over and you're at what amount? We were at about 2000 We needed to get... I think eight to get green lit. It's called green lighting. So that mm-hmm. you get the funding. Yeah. Otherwise you get zero. You get nothing for all your work. He said, this is what we got to do. You got to make a video about it. You got to promote it. You got to put it everywhere. And I made a video. I put it up within an hour, the selfie video. And it was just saying, this is the new deal. We're going to do a match campaign with this donor investor in Hong Kong. And what was simultaneous about that is this other very well-known ex Jehovah's Witness who's British, he asked me to make two exclusive videos for his video series. He interviews lots of ex Jehovah's Witnesses, and he thought the project was super cool. So he brought me on in the middle of the campaign. I went and cut videos. So it took me like about three days to do that. They're rushed, and they're a bit rough, but they were fun. And they, they're still cool. They're still like solid stories from two people we had just interviewed. Also during the campaign, we interviewed with them the first and second week. So it's very fresh material from his audience of about 40,000 people that are pretty tuned into what he does. We got our entire campaign funded in one day because they saw the match campaign video and they saw all the new content on that guy's channel. So how much money came in during that 24 hour period? We ended up bringing in $11,400 in all said and done after fees and everything of your $9,000 goal. Yeah. Which you probably halfway through didn't think you were going to get to. I think basically from everything I read, you need to you need to be at about a third of your way in the first like four days, or you're never gonna make it. Hmm. You need to have some money like really up front, so it looks to everyone who's looking in who have no right. association with your project that it's got some momentum and people care. Because I and imagine when people see that, if they see that no one cares, then they also don't care. But if it's like getting close, mm-hmm. then there's more motivation to be like, Ooh, "Hey, I'm gonna be it. part of this thing that's gonna that's really gonna it's, go." Yeah. Which ironically, the whole thing's just pledges. If it doesn't go, you never spend a dime. Right. But, you know, psychology yeah, is a, a psychology thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very interesting process, and I feel really grateful to have done it and been successful and had so much support from the next Jehovah's Witness community. That was really cool because I'd never met them. I don't know any of these people. I never even heard of any of them until I started the crowdfund thing. That's amazing that people that I don't even know were so passionate about what I was working on, what we were working on. But, and I'm guessing, I mean, you probably don't have any data to know this, but the people that pledged are probably ex Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Yeah. So I very was very specific in targeting that audience because I assumed that they would care more than the average person. Sure. Yeah. Because they have a similar emotional response to this topic as I have from personal experience. And I think that was true. And people have reached out a lot about that. Lots of, I get a lot of emails. About what? Oh, just people's personal stories and oh, yeah. how impressed they are about what I'm working on. And the other spin that we're doing that's different than most media that's like this is it's not really about the dark side of the religion. It's about what life is like on the outside for someone who's left this religion. Mm-hmm. For a lot of people on the outside that have nothing to do with this religion or, or no, I don't really have this similar experience of, of leaving a faith, it may seem that people that leave the religion are doing really normal things. Some people are really excited about celebrating Christmas. It's like this big important thing to them is celebrating Christmas for the first time in their lives or like as an adult on their own or going to college because it's banned to go to get higher education. It's not a complete hard ban, but it's 
really socially banned. You can't do it and still like still really be part of this community when you're in the inside. It's sort of a positive spin. Like what's happening on the outside? What is life like? And it's definitely better. That's the general gist where I think a lot of media just wants to do exploitive newsy kind of media where, oh my God, you had this horrible experience. Let's talk about how much, how screwed up you are now and how therapy will never cure you. <laughs> and I feel like that's what that's what a lot of media does. And I don't I don't like that. I think it's exploitive of ex Jehovah's Witnesses and their suffering. It puts a negative spin on the whole thing. There is there is a lot of negativity there to talk about, but that's not the only story there. There are success stories as well. And there's art and there's creativity and I'll usually work with musicians and artists. That's generally where I go because they've got a they've built their own coping me- mechanism and found their own healthy way to kind of move forward in their lives. I think it's going to resonate with so many people. I'm really excited about it. I think everyone should be excited and anticipate this amazing film that's coming out. Well, you said that there's, what, 8 million that are currently in? Yeah. How many are out? Do you have any guesses on that? I believe it's somewhere between 2 and 3 million who have left the religion who are probably still alive. That's a lot. It's a huge audience. That's like more than a third. Well, it's about 100 thousand a year for the last 20 years but it's probably you know a lesser number going back in time like that sounds it, like more people going out than coming in so yeah so they're they're proselytizing in, in countries that have low education countries that don't have a great situation they're going there and especially christian nations like catholic and colonies and the americas really and then island groups african countries and they're do bringing they go, in lots and lots of people. Like, do they there. go in saying like, whatever you know about Christianity is is wrong, and like, here's the real version? Or are these people that aren't exposed to it? They sort of all? approach it like that. Like, it's a big secret. It's a conspiracy. You've been lied to your whole life. They're wrong. You've been duped. We've got the real answers. For but you. doesn't that like that requires them to acknowledge these other? you know, types of faith, they would have to like tear down other things to like tear down a wall to let themselves in. It's actually a really interesting point you bring up because I grew up, right. I grew up raised in this religion and I was taught because of this religious dogma, they have to teach you about all the other beliefs, all these other Christian groups have and why they believe them, what scriptures they use to enforce their own beliefs and how dumb that is. (laughs) So they basically teach you how to use the Bible to disprove belief, and they make it seem so logical. I'm hacking this. Basically, okay. we're many years <laughs> deep at this point. <laughs> the point is, I grew up hating religion because you're taught to hate religion and exactly hating other religion how to hate religion, and they don't even believe that they're in a religion, even though they use the word. They Where call they it a way of are? life ah. where all other religions are dogmatic and false and have doctrines. They don't believe that they have dogma or doctrine. They do. They print it and they sell it basically. <laughs> and they require they, people to turn in their old copies <laughs> so they can replace it with the new light. Yeah. When I left, I was like, okay, I don't believe any other religion's true. I've already disproved all of them because I was taught how to. And now I've just disproved this one that I'm in. So that means that they all don't make any sense. Was there a moment when you didn't believe in your own anymore that then you thought, oh, well, everything else they told me about disproving the other ones, maybe that's bullshit too. Like, did you re-examine the ones that they oh, taught you how to shut down? Oh, like as if maybe there's one good one out there that they've been hiding from me and like distracting me from yeah i mean well basically because you couldn't believe anything they said so no i just i kind of stopped i was like okay if if they've they've taught me how to disprove things and now i'm using that same logic against themselves and that was enough for me to just put the the whole the whole system yeah well there's that ricky gervais quote we talked about yeah yeah if you burned every holy book in the world holy books would come back but they would be completely different. They would say completely different things, completely different stories. Mm-hmm. If you burned every book on science in the world, they were all destroyed. They would all be reprinted with the same information again because that's how science works. Yeah. It's proven Eventually. through testing. It might take time. Maybe a thousand years. But they would get back to the exact same point. Yeah. Because logic and facts and data. The scientific method encourages people to continually disprove 
what we currently believe. Well, you would have to because that. all I mean the the science or the history of science is that it's been right until it was wrong. You know, the Earth was flat. Yeah. Like scientists are so encouraged to challenge, yeah, the establishment. It's the only way it works. Yeah, people have egos, but people are generally so open to the next, the next science, the next data that comes out on the topic, mm -hmm. and they want to embrace that new thing and understand more and get deeper. We've got to this amazing place as a global society because we embrace science. Well, we didn't all have to, but like the smarter half embraced science. If I were to summarize what you're saying, what I'm hearing is, yes, yeah, science. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, science. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, science. <laughs> Magnets. It's a little Breaking Bad thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> When I pitched to you that I'm going to go film mm, this documentary right. for after we got the oh, right. crowdfunding, your my, original question, my original that we question. never answered. <laughs> I asked you to come up to Minneapolis. How was that for you? Wanting to get involved in film and then having, you know, if you would have invited me up before, like I still would have done it, but like I wouldn't have been able to bring, you know, very much to the table at all. You know, just my curiosity and, you know, frankly, lack of knowledge of the Jehovah's Witnesses that I could ask the kinds of questions that, you know, you or people that were in it wouldn't necessarily think to ask, but only because you didn't have my experience of a lack of experience. Just the idea of being able to work on this project that is obviously a passion project and very important to you, that was just a no-brainer. Like, I was just going to do that kind of no matter what. So, yeah, I was I was excited to, to get out there. And I've been to Minneapolis once before, and I loved it. I thought it was a really great town. I considered moving there at some point in my life. The idea of being able to come back to that city again. In the and summer. And to meet some of your – in the summer, when you have a good group of friends, and they're, they might be in your town, they might be spread out over the world, but you kind of like – I don't know. Hopefully, you reach a point in your life where you're like, I know all these great people, and if any one of them meet, they're going to have a great time. And they're going to like each other. And it's going to like, you don't really have to worry about what those interactions are going to be like. Oh, are they going to get along? Is it going to be weird? Are they going to be quiet? Like, I don't know. Like, I just, I've stopped worrying about that sort of thing like many, many years ago. Those people so, stood the test of time. They're yeah, going to be exactly, fun. Exactly. They're going to be great. I mean, being fun and like, I don't know, I guess creative is like, those are kind of the requirements at this point. So how was it? It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was great. Like I got to dive into this, you know, religion that I knew a little bit about. I got to intimately know these people's stories because we were filming them for many hours, you know, and I got to ask some of the questions to raise those things like, oh, like the, the everyone's going to die. All right. Tell me more about that, because I didn't like study all the various Christian religions to find out what kind of crazy shit they all independently believe that isn't compatible with anything else. It's always comes down to the people. So like you just meet great people. It was a work trip in quotes, but it was also a great fun trip too. Like we got to mix in a lot of different activities. It was great. I really enjoyed that whole process. And those 10 days were probably the most efficient, productive days of my film life. I couldn't say that I could take credit for that. Like there's a lot of planning that went into that and having a schedule and knowing what days we were going to do things. Like, I mean, if you don't know, if you've never been on a film set, they can be long difficult days like you might wake up at four in the morning to get somewhere by five to then work until noon so that you can have a 15 minute lunch and then keep shooting until midnight 12 16 hour days on a film set like that's just that's just how deal. it goes yeah you have it's, all those people the sun dictates a lot of things you know right. like it's how long lighting. you have a location like it, there's just so many different factors that go in you, you just, shoot your sunrise shots at sunrise you also shoot your sunrise shots at sunset and and fake it later. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for bringing me on podcast with your new software that you wrote on the Mox bus. <laughs> you can you can have some. <laughs> well, we get we got an extra slice for you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. right.